Good morning, church. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We are continuing our series called 24, where we're looking at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And today we're going to be reading about Jesus' betrayal and arrest. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 41. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies wonder in malice when I will die and my name perish. And when they come to see me, they utter empty words while their hearts gather mischief. While they go out, they tell it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They think that a deadly thing has fastened on me, that I will not rise again from where I lie. Even my bosom friend in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted the heel against me. But you, O Lord, are gracious to me. Be, ra- be gracious to me and raise me up, that I may repay them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are going to stand together and sing songs of praise to the Lord. I invite you to stand if you're able. We're going to begin by singing, I Stand Amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Well, he took my sins and my sorrows.
next song is called Man of Sorrows. We'll sing, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. The words will be on the screen. If you want to follow along in your hymnal, it's hymn number 24. And we're going to sing all three verses.
joining us on Facebook, welcome. We're glad you're here. Leave us a comment. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. And we're going to take a few minutes to greet those around us in the name of Christ. You guys were sitting down before I got up here for once. That doesn't it? You guys starting to not like each other as much? Not as much to talk about? All right. I'd like to invite the kids forward. What was that? <laughs> Good morning. How are you guys doing today? So today's story is a hard one. Today, we are talking about betrayal. You guys even know what betrayal means? Kind of, maybe a little bit. What do you think? Turning on someone. That's a good definition. I had a hard time coming up with a definition of betrayal. That's a hard word to define. But it's like when, when you trust somebody, maybe, maybe you tell somebody a secret, and you tell them, don't tell anyone. And then they turn around and they go tell everybody. That's betrayal. That's rough, right? That's hard to deal with. So one of Jesus' disciples, one of his closest friends, betrayed him. Actually, a couple of his disciples betrayed him. And Jesus actually predicted that they would do it. He told them. He said, one of you is going to betray me. And then he says, one of you is going to deny me. And they all said, not me, Lord. I would never do that. And it wasn't that they wanted to betray him, right? But sometimes things happen and life comes at you fast and, and you make mistakes that you didn't intend to make, right? And we learn a couple of things from this story. We learn that, number one, the most important thing I think we learned from this story is that Jesus, God, is a forgiving God, right? We look at the fact, next week we're going to look at Peter's denial, when Peter denied Jesus, and then there's a story later in the book of John where, where Jesus kind of restores Peter and gives him an opportunity to, to make it up. And we look at the story of Judas, which is a story we're going to look at today, and, and Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew ahead of time what was going to happen, and he still ate with Judas, and he shared the bread at the Last Supper with Judas, and he shared the cup with Judas at the Last Supper, and they did life together, even though Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. That's a tough one, isn't it? That even when people betray us, and sometimes God calls us to forgive. That can be a hard one. But God is a forgiving God. And he says, I want you to forgive others the way I forgave you. So that's the first lesson we learn is that God is a forgiving God. But we also learn that we sometimes make mistakes that we don't intend to. None of the disciples planned on betraying Jesus. But I think especially in Peter's case, he was scared. 
he got in a situation where he was scared and he didn't know what to do. And he said whatever he could say to save his own skin. And sometimes we make mistakes like that too. But we know in the end that God is forgiving. And that's the most important thing for us to remember in that lesson. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are a forgiving God. That we know that whatever mistakes we make, whenever we stumble, that you're there to help pick us up and dust us off and that your grace is new every day. That you give us second chance after second chance and God, we love you, we want to serve you and we want to do the right thing and we know we're going to make mistakes. But God, help keep us on the right path and remind us every day of your mercy and forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, you guys may be dismissed for Children's Church. And while they head to Children's Church, we are going to worship the Lord through our joyful giving. Invite the ushers to come forward. We're reminded in this time that everything we have is a gift from God and we give back out of the goodness and abundance that he gives us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the gifts that you've given us. God, use these gifts, use us, use the talents and abilities that you have given us to serve you, to to spread the gospel message in our community, in our workplaces, in our schools, and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. We uh, are going to spend some time together in prayer. We are going to lift our prayers to the Lord. We're going to finish this time by saying together the Lord's Prayer. If you need the words to that, they are printed in your bulletin. And before we do that, we've got a couple of announcements. Um, Emily is home. So praise God for that. She was able to come home on Friday. Um, They've got a bed for her. She needs to be on bed rest for, I think, another five weeks in order for all that that to heal, all the work that they've done while she was in the hospital for the last four weeks. So they got a special bed, and they got that in her home so she can recuperate at home, which is wonderful. So um, we will continue to need meals and things, so if you are able to help with meals, um, feel free to contact Emily to schedule that. Um, And also, 
As many of you know, uh, Martha Turnbull passed away this week, and um, the services will be this coming weekend. So Friday from 4 to 7, the visitation will be at the uh, Simpson Funeral Home here in Stanton. And then on Saturday, the funeral service will be here at 11 a.m., followed by a luncheon. And um, there's a sign-up sheet out on the table in the, in the entryway. If you are able to help um, with food for the luncheon, please um, sign up on that sheet there. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you uh, this week. We come to this place to worship you, to praise you, to lift up your name above all other names because you are holy. We gather in this place, Lord, to to acknowledge that we are not the most important people in the world. And God, we lose sight of that often. But by gathering here and, and lifting up your name, we are saying that you are are on the throne, and we are not. We worship you because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We gather in this place to say that we have set aside this time for you. God, help us to remember that during the week that you are on the throne, that you are the king of kings, that you are the ruler of our lives. Lord, we come to this place with confession on our hearts and on our lips because we know that, that since we've gathered here last, we have fallen short of what you have called us to do and to be. God, we confess to you that that we have said and done things that we know we shouldn't have said and done. And we've left things unsaid and undone that you've called us to do. God, we lay those, those things at your feet. And we ask today for your forgiveness. We pray for your mercy and your grace that you would pour your forgiveness out on us. God, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts for all that you do for us. God, we thank you for that mercy and for that grace that you pour out so willingly. We thank you that you love us in spite of ourselves. We thank you that you call us to this place to worship. God, we thank you for this place and the people gathered here, this family that we worship together with, that we study together with, that we rejoice together with, and that we grieve together with. And God, we come to you this morning with cares and concerns. We lift up to you the family and the friends of Martha Turnbull. God, we know that Martha is celebrating with you. But there's an emptiness in us. We miss her. We miss her smile and her presence. And God, we pray for Martha's family and friends that you would give them peace and comfort during this time. Lord, for others in our congregation, in our families, and in our community who who are sick and hurting and grieving, God, we pray that you give them exactly what they stand in need of. God, we celebrate with the Van Cleeks that Emily is home, that she's able to recuperate in her own home. We pray that you continue to bring healing to her body. God, we thank you for so many things. Lord, we pray that you will hear us now as we pray the way you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we go to God's word, we're going to sing one more song. We're going to sing together, Just As I Am. And I invite you to stand if you're able. As we sing together, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark love to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm well. as I am, I would be lost, but mercy and grace, my freedom bought, and now to glory in your cross, O Lamb of God. I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm well.
On the darkest of nights, a plot was thickening. And on this deepening night, a certain character was being revealed, one that would for all earthly time reign in history as a character known for his turned heart, his thorough misunderstanding of God. Judas Iscariot, a name synonymous with betrayal on its most profound level. Judas Iscariot, chosen by the Messiah to follow him, learn from him, be brother to him, Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot. Not many children today run around with the name Judas Iscariot. Judas was with Jesus dining in Mary and Martha's home. He reclined at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of expensive perfume and poured it on Jesus' feet, wiping his feet with her hair. Judas objected, disgusted, saying, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Why, it's worth a year's wages at least. What a waste, a waste. Judas didn't say any of these things because he was in the least bit concerned about the poor. No, he said these things because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, Jesus used, or Judas used it as his own personal banking vestibule, helping himself to what was put into it. So as Judas sat at that last supper, he sat with evil darkness already solidly entangled with his being. Just hours before, Judas had sought out the chief priests, asking them, What are you willing to give me if I finally give you what you want? If I deliver Jesus over to you, what will you give me? Thirty pieces of silver. And with the sound of the promised riches tinkling in his ears, Judas watched for his opportunity to hand over his rabbi, his faithful friend. Until then, he returned to his side, finding himself sharing a meal in an upper room. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted, prompted Judas to betray Jesus when Jesus spoke. Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another with surprise and something like horror. Betray him? Who would betray Jesus? Who would betray their rabbi, their friend? Certainly never one of those closest to him, one of those who sat in this very room. Judas said, surely you don't mean me, rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. Satan entered Judas. And Jesus, resigned to the fateful choices of his friend, spoke to Judas, saying, What you're about to do, do quickly. Judas slinked out of the room, returning to his conspirators on the sly. Into the night he stole, the sound of the thirty pieces of promised silver jingling in his ears, soon to be jingling in his pockets. The priests and elders had promised him that much, and he watched as around him a mob quickly assemble, and he explained where to find Jesus. He knew where they might be going. The Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas marched the mob up the narrow path, guiding them further into the darkness until they were face to face with some sun stunned disciples and the Savior of the world. Judas slithered out from amongst the mob, moving with calculated intent. He had arranged this moment. The soldiers would know who to arrest by the signal Judas gave. One step, two steps, three steps, and he was next to him. Jesus was staring back at him. For a moment, he could have, could he have hesitated? Could he have sought, thought that a sack of silver, shiny pieces of metal wasn't worth this? Isn't worth what might come? If he did, it didn't stop him. Judas, Judas leaned in saying, Greetings, Rabbi. Jesus asked him, 
Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? The deed was done. In a flash, Jesus was under arms and being dragged away. And now Judas was left alone with his precious silver. So little silver, so great a legacy. So sad a legacy. Judas watched as they led the world's great rescuer deep into the dark, sinister blackness before him. His trusting friend now led away like a common crook and soon condemned to die. Judas sank deeper into his own darkness because as he walked, he heard it. Clink, clink, clink. The 30 pieces of silver he now carried clashed together like a chorus of clanging cymbals. Clink, clink, clink. The sound of those sparkling little coins as he moved was deafening to his ears, maddening to his spirit. They tormented him to his very soul. Clink, clink, clink. He was running now, his hands white knuckled gripping the coins. Trying to silence their clamor, he was filled with remorse, and a dark shadow chased him as he ran. Bursting through the doors, he fell upon the priests and elders once more. Take it back! Take it back! Judas shouted at the men who had paid him to betray his friend, but their response was less than sympathetic. What do you want? You have your blood money, now go! I have sinned. I have betrayed an innocent man. I have betrayed my friend. I didn't understand anything. Why he lived the way he lived. Why he will die the way he will die. I didn't understand him. What do we care? That's your problem. Now get out of our sight. Judas had tried to wash his hands of it. He had tried to undo what he had done, but it could not be undone. Clink, clink. Link. Unclenching his fris fist from the bag of silver, Judas tossed it at their feet and in a frenzy fled. And the coins, they scattered. And the disciples, they scattered. And Judas was scattered and surrendered his life to an obliging tree. A life sold. A sad legacy now told. And for what? 30 pieces of silver. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Thirty pieces of silver, Lord, have mercy. So we continue this in-depth look at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, and we get closer and closer to the end. So Jesus has spent time in the upper room with his disciples. He's shared the Passover meal with them. He's washed their feet. They've left the upper room and they're walking through Jerusalem and he's talked to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit and dark days ahead. He's told them to not be troubled, to take heart that they trust the Father and they can trust him. He's prayed to God that they would be strong, that they would remain united. And then they leave the city. And our scriptures today says they walked across the Kidron Valley, which to us mean, makes us think that it was a long ways, but the Kidron Valley is just outside the walls of the city and just across, they say, is a garden near the Mount of Olives, where they often gathered. And that's where we find ourselves today. I'm going to read from John chapter 18. I'm going to read the first 
14 verses. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches. And then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, he came forward and he asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. He replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him, with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. They first took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a story. One of Jesus' closest friends, one of the 12, his inner circle would betray him for a mere bag of silver. And yet here we are. Jesus and his disciples had gone to a place that was familiar to them a place that they had gathered before, maybe to sit and just hear Jesus teach. And Judas knows that this is their hangout. If he wants to find Jesus, this is the place to go. That's where they would go and talk. And he brings the high priests and their police of the Jews, and they even brought along with them a detachment of Roman soldiers. It seems that they were expecting some resistance. They were expecting a fight. And when they showed up, Jesus steps forward, and he says to them, Whom are you looking for? He doesn't hide. He doesn't wait for them to come find him. He steps forward and he says, who are you looking for? It's Jesus' way of saying to us, I am in control of this situation. I know what I'm doing. I know what's going to happen. And he says these words. They say they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. These are the same words that God spoke to Moses in the burning bush. When we hear Moses ask, who are you? And God answers, I am that I am. It's the same words that Jesus says here. And there's, there's meant to be a parallel. We're supposed to know that connection. And certainly the Jews that had came there to the garden 
to arrest Jesus. They heard those words. They knew those words. Now, we don't see this anywhere else recorded except for in John, but he says when, when he said those words, they stepped back and they fell to the ground. I have an image. Alice, if you could put that up on the screen. This is a, an artist's rendering of that moment when Jesus says, I am he, and we see the, the soldiers and, and the servants of the priests falling back to the ground. We don't know if that's exactly what it looked like. But this is a powerful moment that they hear those words, I am he. I am that I am. And they recognize the words of God. And we've said before that all through these last 24 hours, Jesus is trying to make it abundantly clear that he and the Father are one. That he and the Father are are intimately linked together. How many times in these scriptures have we seen Jesus trying desperately to help his disciples understand that he and the Father are one. Right? We go back to John 14 when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the disciples say, well, if you just show us the Father, then we'll understand. And he says, you don't, under, you don't get it. If you've seen me, you've seen him. If you've heard my words, you have heard his words. And then in John 15, he says, I am the vine, and my Father is the gardener. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. I want you to abide in me, just like I abide in the Father. And he continues to make that connection over and over again. And here again, we see him using those words, I am he. And they recognize it right away. And again, he says, who are you looking for? And they answer, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I told you that I am he. And then he asks, he says, if you're, if you're here for me, then let my disciples go. You don't need them. If you want me, take me and let them go. Again, Jesus is in control. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he chooses to not defend himself. This one is hard for us to wrap our minds around, isn't it? That Jesus would just simply allow himself to be arrested, knowing what was to come. He didn't fight back. He didn't argue. He didn't resist. He didn't run. He said, if you want me, here I am. He went willingly. There's three things I think we can learn from this passage. Number one, Jesus goes without violence. He goes without, re, without any kind of trying to stop what's going to happen. We know he doesn't want to do this, right? We've heard his prayer in the garden where he prays to God. He says, God, if it would be your will, take this cup from me. But if it's your will, I'll do it. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't relish the thought of going to the cross. But he knows the plan. He knows the purpose of why he's here. And he doesn't fight back. We also see that Jesus, even in this moment, in his darkest hour, he is still a God of forgiveness. He doesn't lash out at Judas. He doesn't condemn Judas. 
we're going to read the story next week, is about Peter's denial. And when Peter denies him, he doesn't condemn Peter. He's still a God of forgiveness, even in his darkest hour. We hear when he goes to the cross, he's on the cross, he's nailed to the cross, he's breathing his last breaths, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even when he's been betrayed by his closest friends, he still forgives. And I think the most important thing for us to see here is that Jesus was in control of everything that was happening. They did not arrest him against his will. They didn't surprise him and arrest him because he didn't know it was coming. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew exactly where he was going when he went to the garden with his disciples. He had been telling them over and over and over again what was going to happen and why it had to happen. And he remained in control the entire time. When they showed up, he steps forward. He says, who are you looking for? Knowing their answer. When Peter who's always acting before thinking, steps up and he pulls out his sword and he cuts off the servant's ear. Jesus could have just let it go. But he doesn't. He says, Peter, put your sword away. This is not how we're going to do this. This is not how this works. I know exactly what I'm doing. You might not understand it now, but I know exactly what I'm doing. And the reason it's important for us to remember that is because if Jesus was in control of that whole situation, if he knew exactly what was going to happen, then we know that he's working everything according to God's plan. That everything that we read in this book is leading to this point. Everything is leading to this. We have the law in the Old Testament. 617 rules for us to follow. And we see over and over in the Old Testament how the Israelites couldn't do it. They couldn't pull it off. They couldn't obey all the laws. And they would fail, and God would come in and give them another chance. And they would fail again, and God would give them another chance. Do you see a pattern here? Right? This is the story of my life, of your life, that we fail and God gives us another chance and we fail and God gives us another chance. The one thing that sets Christianity apart from every other world religion is this. Every other world religion will give you a set of rules and if you follow those rules, then you get the reward. And God says, I know that you can't follow the rules. I know that you're not capable. And each one of us, we know this already. If we look down into the depths of our heart, right? We know that we can't do it. We know we're not capable. And God says, I know. And I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do it for you. And Jesus followed the plan. He knew his purpose and he followed the plan so that through his crucifixion, through his death, he became the perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sins and for my sins that we were never capable of paying that price ourselves. And in his death, he paid that price. And in his resurrection, he defeated death. And that relationship is fully restored. The curtain in the Holy of Holies is torn in two. We have access 
to God because of what Jesus did. This is powerful stuff. This is important stuff for us to understand. If we're going to understand our faith, if we're going to be able to communicate our faith, when somebody asks you, what, what's so different about your Jesus? I can believe in all kinds of other religions. I can pick whatever religion I want. What's so different about yours? It's important for us to understand this. It's important for us to understand what sets Jesus apart from all the other religions. And it's all at the core in these 24 hours. And even in moments of betrayal and denial and arrest, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing and where he was going. And he was doing it for you and for me. And that's a powerful, powerful message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what an, it's a hard story to wrap our minds around. That one of Jesus' closest friends would betray him and turn him over to be arrested. But God, we know that, that somehow this was all a part of your plan. That it was all part of the plan to reconcile us to yourselves. To, to accomplish something that we could never accomplish. God, help us to remember your forgiveness. Help us to remember that you are in control every step of the way, even when we want to be. God, help us to trust in you with everything we have. In Jesus' precious name we pray and all God's people said, amen. We're going to... Sing one more song. We're going to sing, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. The words will be on the screen. If you'd like to follow in your hymnal, it's hymn number 284. And we're going to sing verses 1 and 3. couple of quick announcements before we go. Uh, next Sunday, the choir will be singing. So uh, choir will be here at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, we'll rehearse. If you want to sing with the choir, be here at 9 a.m. Um, in your bulletin, there is a yellow colored sheet, and there's a survey on there. The vision team um, is doing some planning, and we'd like your feedback. So if you would take that survey out and fill that out, if you want to just leave it on your pew, We'll pick those up later, or you can put them in one of the um, glass jars over by the office, and we'll get those. We'd like to get your feedback on that. 
And um, Easter is coming soon, and we have a lot going on. So Palm Sunday is next Sunday. Choir is singing. We'll have our worship at 1030. Maundy Thursday, we're going to have not a service here in the sanctuary, but we're going to have a multi-station experience for you to, to walk through. And um, we're going to have that open from 1 to 3 p.m. on Thursday and also from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. So I encourage you to join us for that. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we're going to have our sunrise service at 8 o'clock. We're going to have breakfast following the sunrise service and then our regular service at 10.30. So look forward to celebrating the resurrection together there. As you leave this place, go knowing that even in the darkest hour, Jesus was in control and knew exactly what his purpose was. And what a glorious reminder that is. Amen. Go in peace.